Good morning. We hope you're ready for service this morning. Everybody seems excited. There's a lot of chatter going on. So yesterday, Greg and I went to uh, Sophie's cheering. So we went to Sophie's game yesterday. And um, I think it's like first graders that are playing football, first and second, something like that. They're playing football too. So it's these little guys. And half the time, they're going backwards instead of the right way. Um, Greg's like, no wonder they don't get any yardage because they drop the ball and then they pick it up and start taking a few steps backwards. But yesterday, one of the boys was going all the way to the end for a touchdown. And the crowd was just, yes, yes, go, 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 go. And I saw that there's a flag on the play. And some of the parents saw that too, but they were still saying, go, 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 because they didn't care. So today, you know, Greg preached on unity. So today, if there's a flag in your life, we're at your church and we're backing you and we're saying, go, go, go. You're going to make it. And we're going to make it through this. And we're going to have a great service today. So if you will, stand up. And we're going to open with the, this is a move. <laughs> Thank you. 
some new faces here today. Good to see some of you guys that haven't been here in a while. I just want to invite you, don't forget today, after the service, we are going to be having our big celebration party um, in the back. Um, so we're going to have snow cones out there, inflatables. I've got lunch for everybody. Um, we've got some giveaways, some hats. Hopefully you guys grab a notebook on your way in. If you didn't, let us get you on before you leave. I've got stickers. Um, we've got cornhole to play, got some gift cards to give away for whoever wins that today. Um, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, all kinds of stuff. So we got a lot of stuff to just spoil you guys. So I would encourage you to stay after the service today. Just head on back to the gym and we're just going to have a great time of fellowship and just hanging out today. Celebrate what God's doing here that we're able to bring our classes back, get our children's church back. Um, I know there's a lot of parents and a lot of people excited about all that stuff. And so we're just really excited. So let me pray for us this morning, and we'll continue in worship. Father, I just thank you for today. Just thank you for this opportunity that we get to gather in your house. Father, and we get to worship you freely um, and, and openly. Uh, Father, I pray that you would just be with us today. Keep us safe and just let us have a good time of fellowship um, following the service. But Father, while we're here today for this next hour, I pray that you would speak to us through song and through the reading and preaching of your word. Uh, Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts and our lives and that we would leave this place different from when we came. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just transform our hearts and our minds. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. search Sky Ridge Church and our app will pop up um, and you can see that you can download that to stay connected with us and there's a way for you to give on there 
You can also get through our website, see our service times, um, our different ministries, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can give here in person, or also those of you that are watching online um, that are sick, or if you're, you're gone, or for any of those kinds of reasons, you can always mail us um, checks or cash to our P.O. Box 371 here in Noble, Oklahoma. Brother Paul, can I get you to pray over this morning's tithes and offerings? Heavenly Father, it's a glorious day to be in your house today, Father. We thank you for the opportunity, the blessings, and the freedom to be here. Lord, bless the ones that are here. Strengthen us, Lord, with your presence. May your Holy Spirit guide us each day. Bless with a great good day to bring us your word, Father. Strengthen him, Father, and anoint him with your mighty power. Bless our tithes and offerings, Father, for thy glory. We praise your holy name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
we were just talking about when those words, the words come in the back of the we're like, I'm always worried that I'm not going to know the words. So thankfully to Madison and to uh, Chelsea, they were saying those words because I'm going, where are you?
good to see each of you here this morning. And before we get into the preaching of God's Word, well, I would like for you to simply bow your heads and uh, let's pray. Now, I've said this on many occasions when we come to this part. I, I know that when we sing, we lift our voices to the Lord. It's us worshiping God. But when it comes to the preaching hour, I, I want God to be here in all of it. But right now, I, I really pray for God's presence, to, to speak to our hearts and our lives that we may draw closer to Him. It is good to see all of you here today, and uh, I'm excited and glad to, to see the CFO. I've, I've never been able to announce that to anybody. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out what CFO stood for. If you don't know what it does, you'll find out here in a little while, but we're glad to have the CFO from Randall Bible College with us today. But most of all, I'm glad to have the, the lady that runs the state here with us. Her name is Sherry. We're glad to have them with us today. And I just want to ask Brother Todd, if he would, be so kind to lead us in prayer and ask God to be with us in the preaching of God's Word today. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be in your house. Thank you for all the family, individuals here. Lord, we have Brother Greg bringing the message. We just pray that Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles with you this morning and you would like to follow along in the reading of God's Word, we will be in Matthew chapter 6. And I must tell you all this morning that I sound a little funny. Uh, last Sunday when, when, when I was in the pulpit trying to preach, I got real dizzy and uh, kind of lost my balance and then finally got it back and I was having a hard time hearing, and in my right ear, this ear here, kind of got plugged up, and I really couldn't hear at all out of it, and the next morning I woke up, and I told Mona, I said, I can't hear at all, and she said, you're going down to the whatever clinic, and get your ears cleaned out, so I go down there, I waited uh, about four and a half hours down there to get my ears cleaned out, when I sat down, they poured this stuff in, in my right ear and poured it, and the doctor said, well, your left ear looks bad too. So he poured it in there, and uh, we sat there about 15, 20 minutes, and then they take this water, and they shook it in there. And just a little bit came out, and they said, how is it? And I said, well, now I can't hear it all. <laughs> so they said, well, we got to do it again. They poured some more stuff in there, and, and finally, and, and Probably not the place to be telling this, but uh, I'm going to tell it anyway. Uh, this, the, the lady that shot the water in there, she said, that's a rock. And that thing was almost as long as my pinky. And now both ears, they say, are clear and I can hear, but I sound like I'm in a barrel, a teeny barrel. And it just, everything sounds out of whack. And my wife says, it's because your ears have been so dirty for so long, and now you can finally hear so everything sounds kind of funny, but but uh, I, I want to kind of share that with you is now I'm hearing good again, and it's almost like starting over. I'm learning to hear things that I've never heard before, like Josh said he had it done, and he for once could finally hear the turn signal of his car. Now that's bad. <laughs> But it's like starting over, trying to learn to hear things, learn to hear voices, learn to hear sounds again. And if we were really honest, as we have spent the last year, year and a half, living in this pandemic, this, this thing that is trying to destroy our lives and the world in which we live, our church has been hit by it very hard. I've spent the last year, year and a half, and, and never really has shared with any of you 
how I see the church in today's times. And I'm telling you today, as we have fired up our Sunday school, and we will be starting our Wednesday nights again this coming Wednesday night, we're almost like starting all over again. And the million dollar question that I'm asking myself is, Greg, how do we start over? How do we start this thing all over again? Because folks, let's just be really honest. If we were to count the number of people that are here today versus the number of people that were here two years ago, we are cut in half. We have half the people we had two years ago. So where do we go? What do we do? How do we start this thing all over again? And I, I find my heart and my mind directed towards Matthew chapter 6. It's just a very small section. There's seven or eight verses that I would like to share with you this morning. And we're going to begin reading in the 25th verse. Jesus says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What will you eat or what you will drink? Nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one height to his, one inch to his height? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. There in all of that passage of scripture. Our key verse this morning will be simply verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. So my question for me today, and maybe for you would be the same, what does it mean to seek God's kingdom first? What does it mean for you or for me today to, to seek God's kingdom first? In other words, what does it mean to seek His kingdom above everything else in my heart and in my life? Can we today really battle worry and anxiety by simply shifting our focus and our thoughts on Him and ignoring all the worries that we have swirling around us? Is that really the answer? Maybe we should consider a few things that we can learn while seeking the kingdom of God first in the middle of the times in which we are living in today. But I must admit to you this morning that I am a worrier. I worry. And I, I know what you're saying. Our pastor is a worrier. Doesn't the Bible tell us? Doesn't Jesus instruct us not to worry? I'm telling you today, I'm a worrier. I've spent many hours battling anxiety and fear that leaves me paralyzed. But if the truth be told, there are things that have been especially difficult in my life lately. And because of these things, I find myself crying out to God more often than I would like to admit. Crying out words like this, God, I need you to come through right now. Crying out words like, I need you to provide for me because I really don't know how I'm going to get through this. Hmm. I know honesty is the best policy, but that honesty there hurts. You see, it's in response to these prayers and cries that God has always brought me back to this passage of Scripture in the book of Matthew. It's a passage of Scripture that I have read more times than I can probably count. 
It's a section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he addresses the issue of worry. He simply says these words, don't worry. Don't worry because our Heavenly Father knows all too well your need before you ask of it. Now he emphasizes these words when he uses the birds and the flowers. The birds don't store up food. Yet all the time they are provided for. The lilies of the field, the, they don't toil, they don't spin, and, and, and they are beautifully clothed. You see, for years in the midst of such anxiety, this passage of Scripture, God's care for the, for the birds and for the, for the flowers, it's always given me somewhat of a comfort. But I'm going to tell you today, in the season I'm in right now, in the season I'm in right now, God has drawn my focus away from the birds and the flowers. And he's brought me to the verse at the, almost at the end of this passage. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. So what could it mean for us today at the Sky Ridge Free Will Baptist Church? What does it mean for us to seek God's kingdom first. Even when the Bible isn't open, even when it doesn't appear to be open in front of me, that verse has been playing on rewind for the last few months, last few weeks, and probably the last year. I memorized it a long time ago. I don't know when I memorized it. Maybe I memorized it in Bible study or Sunday school. Whatever name you want to put on that class that meets at 930 in the morning. Maybe that's where I learned it. Maybe it was while I was at college. Maybe it was while I was preparing a message in the time past. Whatever it was, all I know is, is I know this verse by heart. And I'm really not sure when I learned it. But now I'm actually wondering, what does this verse mean for me right now? What does it mean for Craig Cleveland to seek God's kingdom first? Jesus spends a whole lot of time addressing our worries and he, he provides a few object lessons for us. He, he uses the birds and he uses the flowers. But I think the beginning of what he's speaking about here, he's simply talking about his kingdom. And he's simply instructing us that the cure to anxiety isn't found in not worrying. Because folks, let's be honest, we've all tried not to worry, haven't we? All you need is one bad doctor's report and the worrying will start. All you need is one pink slip from your boss and the worrying will start. All you need is one phone call and the worrying will stop. And people like me stand behind a podium like this and we tell you God says don't worry. Well, guess what, folks? I'm worrying. I'm worrying. I know we, we don't want to hear that, but I'm just trying to be as honest with you as I can. I try not to worry, but the problem is trying not to worry only generates more worry. The cure to anxiety is found when we look up from our anxieties and we start seeking God's kingdom first. And it's here that we find ourselves circling back to the question I've been asking since the very beginning. What does it mean for you and me to seek God's kingdom first? First, there's a few things I've come to understand in the last few weeks of what it means to seek God's kingdom in the midst of a crazy, wacky world in which we are living in. I think, first of all, seeking God's kingdom means trusting him that he will take care of our needs despite how things look. I think that's the first point of what God is trying to te teach me or instruct me in the midst of my worry and my anxiety of how all of this is going to unfold. It is seeking God's kingdom first, knowing that He will take care of me. We must start here because Jesus starts here. When He's teaching the crowd about how to battle anxiety, He acknowledges the people's needs. But he also acknowledges that his Father in heaven has the ability to provide for those in need. 
We noticed in the text that the birds and the flowers are well taken care of. So we today can trust God that he will take care of us, his children. That's what we've got to believe. That's what we've got to trust. That God is a father that loves us, will not forsake us, will not abandon us. And yes, he will supply our every need. For after all, that's God's promise. That we will have enough. That we will have what we need. But now let me make it personal. This is my life. We, have a, we as a church, we spent almost three years praying. We spent three years praying. Maybe not all of you, but I know I have. I know Sister Fredonna has. I know there's many of you in here for three years. We've been praying for God to send us a youth pastor, to send us an associate pastor. Have we not been praying for that church? Amen. We've been praying. Some of you have been crying out to God saying, God, we need a youth pastor. We need an associate pastor. And through patience and through prayer, God has sent us a marvelous Family to fill that role. Amen. But don't you like it when someone says everything's good, but <laughs> what you're really saying, everything is not good. Here's where I worry. We have a church, we as a church, we pray. We pleaded with God to send us an associate pastor, a youth pastor, someone to help us in that area. And, and God answered the prayer and brought it. But folks, I'm going to tell you, as pastors of this church, I'm ordering. Because we have taken a step of faith and believe and trust God is going to supply that need, but I can't stop worrying. Because if nothing changes, is it fair to bring a young man and his wife into this church that after a while we can't take him? <laughs> it's no big deal to a lot of people, but I'm going to tell you, when you are the pastor of the church and you take on that responsibility, I'm worried. What are we as a church going to do? Are we going to step up to the plate? We've prayed. We've begged with God to send this particular person to our church. And God has opened the door and brought a marvelous couple to our church. And we thank God for that. But are we going to be willing to step up to the plate? Step up and have enough faith in God and help in this need in this area? You see, seeking God and His kingdom first means that we will believe that God will take care of it. And I'm not going to lie to y'all folks. I struggle in that. I look at the financial report and I say, how are we going to do this? And I know that God's telling me, Greg, if you'll just trust me, I'll take care of it. But sometimes Greg gets in the way. And then I start looking towards the heavens and I'm questioning God. God, or, do you know what you're doing? God, are you aware of what's going on down here? And God is simply saying to me in this passage of Scripture, Greg, seek God's kingdom first, and all of these things will be added unto you. But something else I notice in this passage of Scripture is seeking God's kingdom means worshiping Him in the middle place. It's worshiping Him in the middle place. Our anxiety stems out of concern for the future. It's a form of control that says we have to have the answers now to feel safe. You see, knowing what lies ahead is nothing but a false sense of security. True security lies in the middle place. You see, it's in the middle place, but it, the middle place is before we see God answer the prayer. The middle place is before we see the provision that God has in store for us. It's in the middle place, as shaky and as scared as we may feel at that time, we still can worship God. In the middle place, before God answers that prayer, 
You know, you've been praying about for a miracle. You've been praying for the doctor's report. You've been praying about the bank account. You've been praying about the job. It's in the middle place before we see God answer that prayer. It's there that we are to seek the kingdom of God above everything else. It's there that we worship Him. Why is that? Because the truth of who He is never changes. Worshiping before we see the answer is challenging and it's downright difficult. But if we approach God believing in His promises and acknowledging Him no matter what, it's then that we finally get a grip on one thing of who God is. He's God. But not only that, it's then that we find ourselves in the midst of worship. <clears throat> Even in our imperfect faith, we can still worship God. And third of all, seeking God's kingdom means noticing the work God is doing in and around you. When we seek God's kingdom first, it's then that we begin to see what God is doing in us and around us. Let me ask you something. Don't we all want a quick fix to our anxiety? Don't we? The things that we worry, the things that's making us eat tubs faster than we can get them out of the bottle. We want an answer to that anxiety. And maybe, maybe we should turn our attention outward. Keep in mind, folks, the title of the message this morning is Starting Over. Maybe we should stop focusing on the thought that God won't provide. Jesus has already assured us that he will. So just maybe if we could just take our eyes off of that need and try this. Let's try looking around. Maybe we should be looking for where God is at work. Maybe he's at work in your family. Maybe he's at work in your community. Maybe he's at work right there in your own heart. We need to ask him this question. God, how can we partner up with you to do this work? That you're wanting. Maybe we ought to ask him how we can be an agent in helping those around us experience God's kingdom. You see, to seek God's kingdom first, we need to cultivate a heart that says something like this. God, not only do I want to experience you, but I want my community to experience you. So today, we as a church, as we start over, and with that thought in mind, let me share this little story with you. It's a true story. I found out about it this week as I was reading. There was a man that owned a piece of property in a city. Perfect location. He's accepting bids for this property and a church wanted it. So they write their bid on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope and gave it to the man. The man that owns the property, not only did he receive a bid from the church, but he received a bid from Denny's restaurant. Denny's Corporation writes out their bid, puts it on a piece of paper, puts it in an envelope, and the man gets it. After opening all of the bids, two of them are identically the same, the churches and Denny's. They were not off one penny from each other. So the man decided that he would send out a flyer or a mailer and survey the community and ask the community, which would you rather have? Would you rather the church buy the property or would you rather Denny's buy the property? When he received all of his flyers or all of his mailers back, he takes them and he separates them all to see who wins the battle here. I'm sure you can guess who won. Denny's. Now, there's a comment section of the community that filled out the flyer as to who's going to get to purchase a piece of property. And in the comment section said, what is your number one reason for wanting this pe these people to get this property? Paraphrasing the article, the number one reason why Denny's won the contest is because Denny's was willing to meet their need. I get anybody's attention? Let me, let me take it a step farther. This is for my daughter. When she became 
the youth pastor at the church she's at, someone in the church told her, now Ashley, school's about to start and we do a backpack program. My daughter knew what the backpack program was, but she didn't know what that church's backpack program was. The lady that told Ashley about the backpack program said these words, we've always done a backpack program. You need to pick the ball up and you need to run with it now that you are the youth pastor. She said, okay, what, is it, what does it entail? And she said, it's backpacks. You fill up backpacks, you give them to the kids, you give them to the school, and they do their thing with them. She said, okay. So Ashley, really not knowing what that church has always done in the past, she picks the phone up, she called the local school, and she said, this is Ashley with Newbreak Church, and uh, we've always done backpacks. What do you need this year in them? And the lady on the phone says, honey, we have over 100 backpacks from last year. We really don't need them. We need paper. And when Ashley got off the phone, within one week, she had a semi-truck show up with a big, two big pallets of paper for that school system. I tell you the story to tell you this. We're trying to start over. And I just wonder, are we going to get caught up again just doing it how we have always done it? I, I think we've spent a lot of years of just doing it how we've always done it. Maybe it's time we seek God's kingdom first. And then all of these things will be added unto us. There was a day and a time where we used to stand for what was morally right. There was a day and a time where we stood for godly principles. And I think we did that because we as people sat in the pews of our churches and we were informed. So I want to inform you today that we at Sky Ridge Church, as we start over, we must start over first and foremost, seeking the kingdom of God. Amen. And sometimes, folks, seeking the kingdom of God may not mean how we used to do it. We do not teach our children in school like they taught me. My granddaughter's teacher was talking to Josie one day, and she said, oh, Sophie's been such a good student. You have a little boy, don't you? And she said, yes. She goes, oh, I can't wait to get little play. You don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> I share that story to share this with you, and then I'm going to close. In the old days, it was reading, writing, and arithmetic. The three R's. Never had. How do you spell arithmetic? <laughs> Anybody know? But we were taught the three R's. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. And we say that we don't like the new math, correct? Any of you grandmas, grandpas, moms, and dads do homework with your children, you just, you just, you want to shoot somebody. <laughs> You let a second or third grader bring their homework home to you and you'll look at it and you'll say these words, that's not how I was taught. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's better, I'm not saying it's worse, but everything, folks, changes. What doesn't change is the message and the means and the method of salvation. Mm -hmm. That's never going to change. We will never be saved unless we confess our sins to Jesus. We will never make heaven our home if we've not had a personal relationship with God. But when it comes to a church seeking the kingdom of God first, maybe we need to call and find out what they need instead of doing it how we've always done it. Case in point, where is Everly here? She's back in the back. 
Everly walks in this building and she's always got her little iPad and she's looking at it and that this looks neat as could be and you watch that and, and how old's Everly? Six years old and she can just whip her way through the iPad. You tell me that that iPad is going to, that your flannel graph that you want to stick up is going to compete with that iPad? I think not. I know the flannel graph's what you have, but it's not what our kids have. <clears throat> if we're going to start over, we must seek God's kingdom first and allow to be known in the community. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to the end of the message. We come to the end of the thought, the story, of whatever we, we want to call it today, God. But we at Sky Ridge, I think, God, that we are standing at the edge of greatness. I think that there is great possibilities ahead of us. The question is, what are we going to do? Out of all of our worries and our troubles, our heartaches and our sorrows, through everything that we wrestle with in life, God, I wonder, are we going to start seeking your kingdom first. And that means in the middle place, God, that before the answer comes, before the provisions are sent, we still will worship you. Lord, what we did 30, 40 years ago is not wrong. And maybe it will still work today. But Lord, open our minds and our hearts to be receptive to things that we can be a church that is known in this community. Not just amongst ourselves, but that we will be known in the community. God, that is me. That's getting me out of my box. That's getting me out of my comfort zone. So I pray today, God, that you would give me strength and you would give me the courage I need to first of all seek you first to allow all of these other things to be added. We ask these things in your precious son's name. And amen. Will you stand with us please this morning as Sister Teresa plays this verse of invitation. Probably not a sermon or a message for salvation or rededication. It's just a message about our commitment as we start over here at Scott Rivers. Are we going to make the commitment that is required of us to take the kingdom father down the road? Are we going to be willing to make a commitment to get outside of our comfort box? As one preacher told me this week, he said, Greg, go down your street of noble. Walk up to people, put your arm around them, complete strangers, and just say, is there anything I can pray with you about now? That's out of my comfort box. It really is, folks. But I'm going to tell you, for me to be able to do what I need to do as pastor of this church, I've got to get out of my box. And I've got to seek God's kingdom first. And when I start doing that, I think we'd be surprised what could happen. God's calling you to step out of your box, to seek Him first above everything else, above your problems, above your heartaches, above your sorrows. You're still going to seek God. You're still going to worship God. Above your tradition and your old ways and your school ways, you're going you're to step out of that box and you say, God, this is how we're going to do it. Folks, we... We need to build a place called home for a lost and dying world. But until we start seeking God first, I think we're destined. Skyrim Church is destined to a slow decay and dying death. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to see that. I want to see God move. But it's going to take people like you. People like you that's willing to take that step of faith. Step out of that box. And here it is. Put God first. About everything.
Will you come and pray today as Teresa was? today for your presence in the Lord's house. If you would be seated just for a second, we want to do something real quick that we always do. And I'm all, where's, where'd Alan go? Bring him out here. We don't need Chelsea. Alan, did. he's the one that went through all the pain and the labor. Church at 6 30. 
Is that all right with everybody? Wednesday night at 6.30. 6.30. Instead of 7, we're going to do it at 6.30. So we're firing our Wednesday night back up. Come back and be with us Wednesday night. We're going to start jumping into some small Bible studies or some little devotions or maybe a time of testimony. It may be who knows what it is that we need you to come and be a part of it. For after all the saying goes, those who love their church show up on Sundays. Those who love God show up on Sunday nights. And those are who love their pastor show up on Sunday nights. And those who love God show up on Wednesday nights. So kind of keep that thought in mind. Let's stand together. We're going to ask a blessing on our food. We do ask you this. No food or drinks. Brought back into the sanctuary, please. Go up to the gym. Let's have a great day together. Brother Norman, would you be so kind to ask a blessing on our food and dismiss us in prayer, please. Lord, thank you so much for this time we had together, Lord. We just thank you so much for this church and for all that it reaches out to. Lord, thank you for Greg and thank you for all the blessings that you give each and every one of the families here. Lord, we pray for the food that you will use it for the nourishment of our bodies and forgive us where we fail you. And Lord, again, be with us this week. Guide us and direct us and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.